Hello everyone, hope you're doing great. So let us start with chapter number eight of Medieval India, and uh, this chapter is about the government, economic, and social life under the Delhi Sultanate. Let's start with it. The state set up by the Turks towards the end of the 12th century in northern India gradually developed into a powerful and highly centralized state, which for some time controlled almost all the entire country. extending as far south as madurai the delhi sultanate disintegrated towards the beginning of the 15th century and a series of independent states were set up in different parts of the country however the administrative system of sultanate had a powerful effect on many of them and also influenced the mughal system of administration which developed in the 16th century the sultan Although many of the Turkish sultans in India declared themselves lieutenant of the faithful, that is the Abbasid Caliph at Baghdad, and included his name in the khutbah, it did not mean that the caliph became the legal ruler. The caliph had only a moral position. By proclaiming his supreme position, the sultans at Delhi were only proclaiming that they were a part of the Islamic world. The sultan's office was the most important in the sultanate and political legal and military authority vested in him. He was responsible for the safety and security of the state as such he was responsible for administration and was also the commander in chief of the military forces. He was also responsible for the maintenance of law and justice. To discharge these functions he appointed judges the sultan acted as a court of appeal from the judges a direct appeal could be made to him against the high handedness of any of these officials the dispensation of justice was regarded as a very important function of the ruler we have referred to the stern manner in which balban dispensed justice not sparing even the relations of high officers of the state Muhammad Tughlaq applied this even to the religious classes ulama who had previously been exempted from harsh punishments no clear law of succession developed among muslim rulers the islamic theory adhered to the idea of election of the ruler but accepted in practice the succession of any son of a successful ruler however all the sons of a ruler were considered to have an equal claim to the throne the idea of pre mongi pre uh, primo genitor was fully acceptable neither to muslims nor to hindus some rulers did try to nominate one of the sons not necessarily the eldest as the successor el tutmish even nominated a daughter in preference to his sons but it was for the nobles to accept such a nomination while the muslim opinion generally adhered to the idea of legitimacy there was no safeguard against the usurpation of the throne by a successful military leader as happened more than once in delhi sultanate thus military strength was the main factor in succession to the throne however public opinion could not be ignored for fear of public opinion the khaljis could not dare to enter delhi for a long time after disposing the successors of balban but built a new town called shiri central administration the sultan was assisted by a number of ministers who were chosen by him and remained in office at his pleasure the number powers and functions of the ministers varied from time to time a definite system of administration developed towards the end of the 13th century the key figure in administration was the wazir in the earlier period the wazirs were primarily military leaders in the 14th century the wazir began to be considered more an expert in revenue affairs and presided over a large department dealing with income and expenditure Muhammad Tughlaq paid close attention to the organization of the revenue department his wazir Khwaja Jahan was widely respected 
and was left in charge of the capital when Muhammad Tughlaq went out to deal with rebellions. A separate auditor general for scrutinizing expenditure and the accountant journal for inspecting income worked under the wazir. Although quarrels between different officers hampered the smooth functioning of the department, the revenue department under Muhammad Tughlaq was able to cope with the affairs of the largest empire and had come that had come into existence in India since the breakup of the Mauryan Empire. Khani Jahan, a coveted Tailang Brahman who was chosen by Feroz Tughlaq as his wazir, enjoyed full authority in the revenue department. His long spell of 18 years as wazir is generally considered a high watermark on the wazir's influence. In accordance with Feroz's policy of making offices and Iqtas heredity, Khani Jahan was succeeded by a wazir as wazir by his son Khani Jahan II. The attempt of Khani Jahan II to play the kingmaker after the death of Feroz and the failure of attempt resulted in a setback to wazir's position. The importance of wazir could revive only under the Mughals. The most important department of state next to the wazirs was the Diwaniyars or the military department. The head of this department was called the Ariz A. Mamalik. The Ariz was not commander in chief of the army since the Sultan himself commanded all the armed forces. In those days, no king could have survived on the throne if he entrusted the chief of command of armed forces to someone else. The special responsibility of the Ariz's department was to recruit, equip, and pay the army. It was Balban who first set up a separate Ariz's department in India. After he and later Alauddin Khilji paid close attention to its working, Alauddin insisted upon a regular muster of armed forces. He also introduced the branding system, Dag, of the horses so that the soldiers may not bring horses of poor quality to the muster. A descriptive role of each soldier was also maintained. The army was posted at different parts of the country, a strong contingent remaining with the ruler in the capital. Balban kept his army in good trim by making it march over long distances on the pretext of undertaking hunting excursions. All of, of all the Delhi rulers, Alauddin Khilji had the largest standing army. The strength of his army is placed at 3 lakhs by Barani, who appears to be exaggeration. Alauddin was also the first Sultan who paid his soldiers fully in cash. Earlier, the Turkish soldiers had been assigned a numerous number of villages in the Duab for the payment of their salaries. These soldiers had begun to look upon these assignments as hereditary and were not prepared to give up these posts even though many of them had become too old and feeble to serve. Balban tried to resume these holdings but modified his order due to agitation created by these soldiers and the pleading of his old friend the Kotwal of Delhi. But Alauddin abolished these holdings by the stroke of a pen, he paid 238 Tanaks to a trooper and 78 Tanaks to more Tanaks more to one who maintained two horses. The efficiency of Alauddin's army was the main factor in his ability to contain the Mongol invasions while conquering Deccan at the same time. The Turks who maintained a large number of elephants which were trained for war purposes. A core of sappers and miners was also attached to the army for clearing the roads and removing the obstacles for the march of the army. The Turks and Afghans predominated in the cavalry which was considered prestigious. The Hindus were employed both in the cavalry and infantry at the time of Ghaznavids. They continued to be employed but largely in the infantry in the subsequent period. There were two other important departments of state, the Diwane Rilasat and the Diwane Insha. The former dealt with religious matters, pious foundations and stipends to deserving scholars and men of piety. 
इट वॉज प्रिजाइडेड ओवर बाय द चीफ सदर हु वॉज जनरली अ लीडिंग काजी ही वॉज जनरली ऑल्सो द चीफ काजी द चीफ काजी वॉज द हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जस्टिस काजीज वर अपॉइंटेड इन वेरियस पार्ट ऑफ द एम्पायर पर्टिकुलरली इन दोज प्लेसेज वेयर देर वॉज साइजेबल मुस्लिम पॉपुलेशन द काजीज डिस्पेंस सिविल लॉ बेस्ड ऑन द मुस्लिम लॉ शरिया The Hindus were governed by their own personal laws, which were dispensed by panchayats in the villages and by the leaders of the various castes in the cities. Criminal law was based on regulations framed by the purpose, for the purpose by the rulers. The Devane Insha dealt with the state correspondence, all the correspondence, formal or confidential, between the ruler and the sovereigns of other states. and with his subordinate officials was dealt with by his department there were number of other departments in addition to these the rulers post intelligence agents called barids in different parts of the empire to keep them informed of what was going on only a nobleman who enjoyed the fullest confidence of the ruler was appointed the chief barid the ruler's household was another important department of state it looked after the personal comforts of the sultan and the requirements of the large number of women in the royal household it also looked after the large number of karkhanas or departments in which goods and articles needed by the king and the royal household were stored sometimes these articles were manufactured under royal supervision firoz tughlaq had set up a separate department of slaves many of whom were employed in these royal workshops the officer in charge of all these activities was called wakilidar he was also responsible for the maintenance of proper decorum at the court and placing nobles in their proper order precedence order of precedence at formal receptions firoz also set up separate department of public works which built can canals and many of his public buildings thank you everyone for tuning in in the next part we'll start with local administration that is on page number 77 of chapter number 8 medieval india thank you for tuning in all the best for exams and do share and subscribe the channel for more videos like this thank you everyone